Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining this workshop. I'm really excited to be with you today. Um, I, my name is Alicia Rosam, and I work for the Placer County Office of Education as the coordinator for Foster Homeless and CSEC Youth Services. And CSEC is uh, children who are experiencing sexual commercial sexual exploitation. Um, I should also say that I'm a former employee of the California School-Based Health Alliance, so it feels especially um, special to be back um, presenting with them. Um, my boss is my boss, Mike Lombardo, was also newly on the board, so I think I was contractually obligated um, to do a presentation today. Um, so before we get started, I just want to say, um, Asma is monitoring the chat. Please interrupt me, um, ask questions, ask for clarifications. Um, I want this to be as interactive as possible in this format. Um, I also just want to say that um, this is my usual um, my usual disclaimer is that I'm not a lawyer, but I play one on TV. Um, so since being in this role, um, I think this is my fourth year in this role, um, I have had to learn a lot about um, legislation that applies to youth in foster care and youth experiencing homelessness. Um, and I've had the um, great opportunity to learn from all of the organizations, from folks representing all of the organizations that you see featured here. Um, in particular, I wanna um, call out the National Center for Youth Law, who has done um, a number of presentations on legislation related to foster and homeless youth. And I think we're probably um, at this conference talking about HIPAA versus FERPA. Anyway, um, so th that's my disclaimer. I'm not an attorney, but I end up um, consulting with folks in those positions a lot, consulting with technical assistance providers across the state and the country um, to make sure that we are appropriately advocating for the rights of young people um, in these situations. Um, just a little bit about the Placer County Office, Office of Education, specifically our department, the Prevention Supports and Services Department, which is um, led by Mike Lombardo, um, um, my boss, who's the board member at CSHA. So hopefully I didn't miss anything, but these, these are the programs that we offer in our department. And um, if you don't work with county offices that County Offices of Education, um, you might not know that we actually serve every district and charter school in our county, um, and we also operate some schools um, ourselves. So we have a couple of charters, we operate a continuation school, we run the school in our local juvenile detention facility. Um, but our program, um, Foster, CSEC, and Homeless Education, we serve both our own LEA as well as um, the programs across our county. Um, I also just want to acknowledge that the, the true um, folks who are doing all of the work around this advocacy and support, um, this is the Foster Homeless CSEC team, and our, all these beautiful faces and beautiful people are the ones who are day in, day out um, advocating for young people, working with resource families, with school districts, with social workers, with probation officers, all in the interest of um, helping support these young people towards um, school support and high school graduation. So just a big shout out to the team um, and for you to know that um, hopefully your local county office of education has similar folks in these roles that can be leaned on um, when you need support. Okay, so um, this is an opportunity for you to, to um, type in the chat. I wanna know um, what, are you, what do you already know or what are some things that you could imagine um, being needs for young people who are in foster care or unhoused? Um, so, so let's start with this first question. Just type it in the chat. What are some barriers um, specific to school and learning that you can imagine young people in foster care or unhoused encountering? What are some barriers? So just type some ideas in the chat and Asma is gonna um, read them as they come up. So we have school stability, transportation, right. having a safe space slash anxiety, mm -hmm. natural supports. Yes, or lack of natural supports, yes. Any other education barriers folks are thinking about? Relocation of schools, mm -hmm. food, 
feeling yep. safe, yep. basic need is met, confidence. Excellent. I feel like I can just turn this presentation over to the participants. Very good. All right, let's shift it. Now, what are, how are some ways that you as educators or other educators that you work with are supporting students in these situations? What can educators do to support young people in foster care or experiencing homelessness? Technology. Yes. Daily check-ins. Yes. Anything else? Support groups. Yes. Oh, I love that. Community-based resource and referral. Yep. And then having those community-based folks work closely with school-based supports. Great. All right. And then finally, um, what questions do you have? What questions do you want me to attempt to address today? Um, and I'll, I'll say this. If I don't know the answer um, or if I don't know it for sure, I will um, find out for you. Any questions? <clears throat> No burning questions coming up. <clears throat> okay, so again, if things come up while I'm presenting, feel free to type in the chat and Asma will interrupt me um, so that we can address your questions as they arise. Oh, we have one question. Great. Perfect. How well do the school staff know the laws to protect the youth? Great question. The answer, like with almost everything, is it depends. But I'll address that for sure. Okay. If other questions come up, type them in anytime. Um, so here's what we're going to do today. We're going to talk about um, some of the unique needs for these young people, um, some of their educational outcomes that, as you can imagine, are, are pretty daunting. And then we're going to talk about some laws, procedures, and trauma-informed practices that will hopefully improve outcomes. Um, for young people in these situations. Um, I, I kind of approached this presentation with an assumption that folks don't know a ton about the rights and the needs of youth in foster care and youth who are unhoused. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep it pretty basic, but know that if you want to dive deeper, um, there's you know, some resources that I can share with you towards the end um, so that you can really dive into the, the uh, law. Okay, so let's start thinking about youth in foster care. So just a, a couple of um, broad um, data points. And, and this data is from 2018-19. Almost all of the data in the presentation is going to be from that year, um, simply because the pandemic um, really skewed a lot of the data or made data collection especially difficult with regard to these um, populations of students. So I just made the decision that we would look at 2018-19 as that was sort of the last complete in-person um, regular times school year. Um, so at that time, there were about 60,000 youth in foster care throughout the state. And this kind of surprised me. The rates were highest in rural counties. Um, there is overrepresentation of black and brown youth, especially youth who are African American and Native American. Um, over half of youth are in placements with family members or in some other home type placement like a um, foster home. And, and if you don't know, the vernacular around that has changed um, and we are now um, referring to foster homes as resource homes and foster parents as resource parents. Um, so I will I will um, try to remember to use that appropriate language, but um, know that you know a lot of times folks will still use that term foster. Um, but what that means is that the while over half are in those home like placements, um, you know just under half are in more um, like congregate care settings like group homes, which are now called. STRTPs or short term residential treatment programs or other type of um, group settings. Um, 
this is a pretty daunting bit of data. Over a third of youth in care experience three or more home placements during um, the jurisdiction of the courts, so during their time in foster care. And we will come to learn that that is incredibly impactful on education. And here's the other thing, and this kind of goes to that, that question around how well do school staff know the laws? And the answer is typically not very well. And here's the reason. Um, youth in foster care only represent about a half a percent of the total population of um, California students attending public schools, half a percent. So in Placer County, we have um, 18 school districts and 23 charters, and we have some school districts that have one foster youth or maybe five foster youth. And that can mean that, you know, in, in a particular school, there could be none. And then a foster youth enrolls and they um, may not immediately be aware, they may not immediately know what rights this young person is entitled to, and frankly, a lot of times the person who enrolled them doesn't know a lot of that either. And, and that was part of my motivation for um, wanting to deliver this presentation, is the more folks in a position to advocate that we can um, get in the know, the better the outcomes are going to be um, for young people. Um, in you know our county, as may be the case in other counties throughout the state, we have a huge range of school districts in terms of size and diversity and services that they offer. You know, Placer County has a handful of school districts that are one school districts, and that means that the superintendent is also the principal, is also the special education director, is also the substitute teacher, and is also generally the main point of contact for youth in foster care and homeless. And so when you have that many roles, it can be difficult to um, you know, keep in mind all of the special laws um, and benefits that are extended to these students. Um, Alicia, we do yes. have one question in the chat. Sure. Well, what is have homeless youth students and what is the requirements to register in school i'm gonna i'm gonna put that question on hold and i'm going to address that um, momentarily so i'll talk about what defines homeless and then what the procedures are for proper enrollment okay so just a, a few um outcomes related to youth and foster care. So, so you said this when you identified some of the barriers, um, school stability. So students in foster care experience higher rates of school moves and transfers compared to their non-foster peer. So one third attended two or more schools during a single school year. Um, that is incredibly impactful on not only um, their academic attainment and, and um, academic skills, but also um, feelings of safety and social emotional support and connection to schools. Um, youth in foster care have a, a disproportionately lower graduation rate, so 64% compared to 85%. And they also have um, a way disproportionately higher um, suspension rate. Um, they are suspended at a rate of 14.6%. Um, some additional statistics, foster youth missed the most school um, compared to their peers. They have a chronic absenteeism rate that's double than their peers. Um, only about 10% are, are deemed prepared for college and career as they approach their later high school years. Um, so the, the academic outcomes are really um, really have a long way to go to be on par with um, their peers. So what is foster? What counts as foster? So the definition of foster youth and education um, is what you see here. And this is um, any child who is what we call a 300 or a, a youth who has a juvenile dependency court petition. Um, it does not matter if this child has been physically separated from their parents or their caregivers, their guardians. Um, it's the, the, what matters is them having this 300 status. It also includes young people who are 602s, which is a juvenile delinquency court petition, um, and who have also been removed from their home. So this would be a young person who is on probation and who is placed in perhaps a SCRTP or group home or placed with a relative 
or um, in, in some other placement outside of the home setting. It also includes young people who are 18 to 21 in extended foster care. Um, and the definition has expanded just this year that just with this legislative cycle, it now it also includes youth who are under the jurisdiction of a tribal court and youth who are subject to voluntary placement agreements. So what that last one means is that sometimes child welfare um, departments will intervene and support a family through a voluntary case, meaning that the child um, will have a social worker and they'll have you know all of the supports that come along with child welfare services, but there won't be a formal dependency court petition. They have a voluntary case. Um, and new this year, um, for the purposes of education, those youth um, should also be extended all of the rights that I'm about to talk about. The most important thing for you to remember about the definition of foster and education is that it is not their status for being counted as foster and education is not determined by where or with whom they live. They may still be living with their um, biological parents or their legal guardians, but they still have that foster status. <clears throat> okay. Um, so let's talk a little bit about homeless. <clears throat> so again, a little bit of data around homeless youth in California. So in 2018-19, our school districts identified approximately 3.2% of their students as homeless. Um, you can see that it's actually a far greater number than foster youth, 207,000. And then below are the different categories of homelessness that they were identified as. 85% um, um, were doubled up, meaning they were sharing the housing of others um, due to economic circumstances or other safety issues. Um, and then a few, 7% um, in shelters, 5% in hotels, 4% in unsheltered. Um, what my, what the team here in Placer County has discovered is that a lot of times families are changing their housing situation on a weekly or even daily basis. So a family that is doubled up could very quickly find themselves sleeping in their car or in a hotel and then back to being doubled up with another family and then back into a shelter um, very transient um, living situations. Um, there was an audit in the state of California a couple of years ago that found that California school districts are significantly under identifying McKinney Vento or homeless students. Um, they, um, they deemed that a benchmark um, number is about 10% of any district's free and reduced population. So if that 10% were applied to the state of California, um, it would be about uh, 103,000 more students than we currently have identified. This under-identification is a statewide issue, um, and there's some new legislation that I'll talk about in a moment to try to address that. Um, some of this is that it's, it can be very difficult to identify these um, young people in these situations. Sometimes they transfer schools before you even know about their living situation. Um, sometimes families are just really worried about revealing that they're in unstable housing. Um, and a lot of times they think that that's going to be a reason for child welfare involvement. So we'll talk about some strategies that schools can use to, um, to um, encourage families to um, share their living situation and how they can be supported. Um, very similar uh, educational outcomes to youth in foster care. So poor school stability, um, higher dropout rates, and higher suspension rates um, compared to their peers. Um, they also have, a, it doesn't say it here, but a 21% chronic absenteeism rate. We find um, through our county SARB process, the Student Attendance Review Board, we often discover that homelessness is a significant contributing factor to attendance challenges. Okay, so here is the definition of homeless in education. So. And um, when I came to this work, my understanding of homelessness was very much like the HUD definition of homeless, like shelter, um, uh, sleeping on the street, in a tent, et cetera. 
the homeless definition in education is much broader. So any family lacking fixed, regular, and adequate housing. And so it could be an unsheltered location. It could be emergency shelters or transitional housing. It could be motels or hotels or campgrounds. Um, and the biggest difference between sort of HUD homeless or what we sometimes call literally homeless and McKinney-Vento is this last bullet point doubled up. So sharing the housing of others due to economic hardship, laws of housing, et cetera. I would also include in that um, safety issues. So sometimes families are doubling up because the apartment that they're live in, living in doesn't have adequate utilities. Uh, the water is not running. Um, the um, toilets aren't working. There's, um, you know, missing glass from windows. Um, the heat isn't working, et cetera. So that would count as doubled up. We also, also have some families who are doubled up because of safety issues. So families that are escaping domestic violence. Um, so really what, what I do when I'm supporting our school districts is I go back to this definition of fixed, regular, and adequate. And if the housing that they're staying in is not fixed, regular, and adequate, then we should seriously consider whether they qualify for McKinney-Vento. Another sort of um, big difference between foster and homeless is that, you know, typically foster youth are identified by their court status or by child welfare or probation involvement. So there's sort of this external identification. For McKinney-Vento, school districts learn about that. It is the school district's responsibility to identify these students and connect them to supports and services. Um, so how do school districts do that? How do they find out who their students are that are experiencing homelessness? The number one way is having school staff who understand this and are attuned to it. And so a lot of my time as the county coordinator is spent training folks in schools to be attuned to the signs and symptoms of homelessness. Um, to know what to do if they overhear a student mentioning that they um, slept in a car the night before or are sleeping on somebody's living room floor or if they say that they got evicted or are about to get evicted. Um, we really want to make sure that that's, those school staff um, refer that student or that family to somebody at the school site or in the district that can help. Other ways that school districts learn about these students are through these McKinney-Vento posters that you see here. Um, so we have these posters um, in multiple languages that we um, deliver to schools throughout our county. And the, the audience for these posters is really families. And it's really about sort of reminding or helping families to understand that even if you have uncertain housing, even if you have moved to another community or you're kind of bouncing around from place to place, your child has the right to remain in their school. And so our hope with these posters is that families see them and then they feel a little bit safer asking somebody about um, these rights and about what resources are available to them. The posters also sort of um, have a secondary role of being a, a visual reminder to the school staff that if they hear something, that that family might, might actually be McKinney-Vento. Um, a really effective way of identifying these students is through housing questionnaires. Um, this is um, something that is also going to be required of schools, um, actually immediately, that upon um, registration, schools are required to um, give families a housing questionnaire. Um, it's something that I did for my son when I registered him for first grade this year. Through that registration process, I answer um, a very simple question about my housing situation. Am I permanently housed? Am I sharing the housing of others? Um, am I living in a shelter? Am I living in a hotel? And it asks right in that registration process. You're not going to get every single McKinney-Vento family that way, but you will get um, more more than you would if you didn't ask those questions. Um, we finally, have, oh, sorry. Yes. We have another question in the chat box. Um, will you discuss specific issues regarding unaccompanied minors? So um, I can address some of those issue, issues. I don't, what I, what I think I would like from that participant is 
tell me what your specific question is, and then I will um, make sure that I address that. Um, young people, let me just go back a slide back to the definition of homelessness. So I, I talk a lot about families, but all of these living situations, if it only applies to an individual young person who is not in the care of a parent or guardian, they would also um, be considered McKinney Vento as well. So if you have a young person who's couch surfing, if you have a young person who is um, living in a youth shelter, if you have a young person who is living in their car, um, it does not matter why. So whether they ran away or were kicked out or there's discrepancies between what they say and what their parent or guardian says, um, those students um, can still um, be considered McKinney-Vento and receive those services. Okay. Um, <clears throat> just so, so identification of McKinney-Vento students is a lot more challenging than with foster youth. Um, and there's, but the good news is that um, there's more um, attention being paid to um, how, we, how school districts can identify these students and supports put in place um, to help them do that. A lot of times what our team finds is that we become aware of a family and we are proactively notifying the school district. So we work really closely with a lot of the housing and community-based organizations in Placer County. And through that, we'll get a referral or a, you know, a student needs to enroll in school. Um, and then we will, we will be the ones to sort of notify that school district. Couple of other um, identification tips. Um, for school districts to keep in mind, right? So even if they are only homeless for a short time, they, they still um, may count as McKinney-Vento. Um, even if they are not willing to self-identify as homeless, um, but you know that they are in that living situation, you should still be, or your school district should, should still be um, identifying them as such and providing them with um, similar services and supports. Once a young person is identified as McKinney-Vento, um, those rights that I'm going to talk about in a moment extend all the way until the end of the school year, even if their homelessness ends before the end of the school year. Um, so I encourage school districts to just keep them coded as McKinney-Vento and to um, do that cleanup data at either the end of the school year or the beginning of the, the next school year. And the reason that all of this matters is because, you know, when we see those low numbers of, of identified students throughout California schools, it all relates to how these students are being identified in the school district student information system. So that, that toggling on or off of the McKinney-Vento kind of coder in Aries or PowerSchool or whatever you use really matters because it's how those students get captured um, into the, the statewide numbers. So what are some signs of homelessness that we share with our school districts? Um, a big red flag is um, children who've been enrolled in multiple schools um, or who have big gaps in learning. Um, we had one fourth grader a couple of years ago who had been enrolled in 22 schools, 22, 22 school changes in there um, in fourth grade. Um, students who are having, you know, consistent attendance issues, students who are talking about moving frequently or sleeping in places that you wouldn't expect um, a child to be sleeping in. Um, students who appear to not have a lot of their basic needs met, maybe they're wearing the same clothes to school every day, or um, they have general poor hygiene, or they're just very um, sleepy, very fatigued. Um, you know, it's really hard to get a good night's sleep um, in a hotel room when you're sharing it with five other people. Um, of course, all of these signs can be signs of lots of other things, but these are things that we, even, even if they're not indicative of homelessness, they're definitely indicative of that student or family needing some additional support. Um, when a school district learns that a student is homeless, um, they can have them complete a McKinney-Vento form. This is just an example of the PCOE form. Um, 
it's, it can serve as sort of the formal verification of homeless status. It's particularly important for um, older students, high school age students, um, because there are some um, post-secondary benefits um, through grants and through the FAFSA process that are extended to students who are unaccompanied or homeless. Um, and that this can serve as sort of that formal uh, proof of homelessness. That said, this is not an absolute requirement. So again, you may have families who you're, you're like, you know that they are in a McKinney-Vento situation, but they are um, ashamed, embarrassed, or too proud to um, say that. They'll insist that they're not. You don't, this form is absolutely not um, required in order to serve that family, to code them as such in ARIES, and to give them um, the services that they need. Um, I'm going to pause there and see if there are any questions before I move into rights um, that are extended to these students. Okay, continue to interrupt me if other questions come up. Um, just wanted to highlight that the sources for this section um, are multiple. These are three of the biggest ones. Um, the Foster Youth Education Toolkit, the California Foster Youth um, Education Task Force um, fact sheets, which were updated um, just in 2021. And they have, um, you see that I've got we this. Actually uh, got, sorry, oh, we actually yeah, got okay. a question right now. Uh, yeah. What has been your experience in getting students to identify as a homeless youth? like unaccompanied youth or any youth? It just is homeless right okay. now. Yeah. Um, you know, if it's an individual young person, um, our experience has been generally pretty positive once we um, explain to that young person the rights that they have and that they, they they have a right to continue to be in school and they have a right to, if they're not currently enrolled, to enroll in school. And we start to break down some of the barriers to that. So if a young person is unaccompanied, <clears throat> but they are, um, you know, sharing the housing of others. So for example, a young person that we're aware of is, had, had been kicked out of their home um, and dropped out of school and was working and was kind of living out of her car or bouncing around from different friends' houses. And she worked with another young person who learned of her situation and then asked um, this other young person said, I'm going to bring you home and we're going to see how we can support you. Her mom was a social worker. Um, and um, so that young person started living with this other family. And we were able to get this young person enrolled in school through something called a caregiver affidavit. Um, and at that point, you know, lots of um, rights and benefits get extended to this young person once they're enrolled in school. So uh, our experience, you know, we, we don't have a ton of unaccompanied youth in our county. Um, I think the last data that we had was around 100, whereas, you know, in larger counties like San Francisco or Los Angeles, you're probably looking in the thousands. But um, what we we really try to do is start from a place of how can we support you educationally? How can we um, help you to get enrolled in school or to get what you need to be successful in school? Um, and and then, you know, from that point, we can help connect them to other services to get them um, housed. Um, so our experience has been generally positive. Um, we do a lot of, we, we would consider, you know, from like a tiered perspective, we would consider young people who are unaccompanied as um, at least initially having some pretty intensive tier three needs. I hope that answers the question, but if not, um, let me ask again and I'll clarify. Okay, so. Um, we have another question. Sorry. No, I'm, um, I love it. Along the same lines, do you have a breakdown of what is the best way to identify homeless youth for these services? Um, I am, I'm going to refer you to a couple of resources that have a million tools for just that. 
So it's like a guide for asking those questions. Um, so I'll get to that in a minute. Okay. Um, so again, I want to share that um, the sources for this section around sort of these rights and laws come primarily from these three um, toolkits that you see featured here. Um, this NACI toolkit, the National Association for the Education of Homeless Children and Youth, is um, an incredibly useful tool. Um, and I will also say that we have called NACI for consultation and somebody actually picks up the phone. So it's a pretty fantastic organization. Um, we also frequently use the California Department of Education um, and the National Center for Homeless Education. Okay, so just want to go into a few of the rights and laws. This is not a comprehensive list. I'm just going to give you, um, in the interest of time, just a few. Um, the other thing to know is that a lot of the rights and services that I'm about to describe um, also apply to um, other young people who have similar challenges. So it also, it, a lot of these rights also apply to young people who are migrant youth to young people who have spent time in a juvenile detention facility. Um, I don't know if this actually passed, but there was talk about extending um, some of these rights to young people from military families because they um, often encounter a lot of um, moving around as well and a lot of trauma. Okay, so first and really important thing for you to know is that um, every school district in the state must designate somebody in their district as the educational liaison for foster students and for homeless students. So in some school districts, it's the same person for foster and homeless. In some school districts, it's separate. And liaisons are responsible for all of the things that you see listed here. They really are intended to be kind of the local expert and main advocate and point of contact for young people in foster care or who are homeless. Um, in the case of unaccompanied youth, um, unaccompanied minors, um, this the homeless liaison um, is often um, sort of expected to be the main advocate for young people in that situation. So for example, um, I'll talk about this later, but if an unaccompanied youth needs support with transportation to school, that homeless liaison is the one who's supposed to kind of um, ask for that and make sure that that happens. Um, so this is, if, if you um, are working with a young person in foster care or you're working with a young person who might be homeless, knowing who this person is in your district is really important. Um, in Placer County, we call these liaisons the fiddles um, because they serve, um, they serve in a dual role as both the foster and homeless liaison. Again, a lot of times these folks have multiple roles in their district, right? I cannot think of one foster and homeless liaison that I work with where that is their only job. Um, so um, it's just important to keep that in mind that they sometimes need some support and reminders about the rights. And in that case, every county in the state has a me, has a, as a person who is overseeing um, foster youth services and homeless education. And again, it might not be the same person. So for example, in Sacramento County, it's, it's a different person. Um, but um, it, your county liaison should definitely be um, leaned on if the school district liaison needs some technical assistance or support. <clears throat> this laundry list is um, just a sampling of um, the educational rights and benefits that these students have. I am not going to go over all of these today, but I just want you to see that advocates have done a pretty great job of um, thinking about what um, these young people need to have better educational outcomes. Um, in general, schools must remove barriers for these students um, to have full participation in school. So that's oftentimes what I think about um, when I'm thinking about the actual implementation or deployment of these laws is what can we do to remove these barriers? What can we do to make it um, easier for this student to have um, a similar experience to their non-foster or non-homeless peers? 
Okay. Um, the most important right, <laughs> if, you, if you leave this presentation not knowing anything else, this is the most important. The most important right is the right to the school of origin. So what is what can be a definition of the school of origin? It can be the school that the student attended when they were permanently housed or before they were in foster care. It could also be the school in which the student was last enrolled. It can also be the school that they have a connection to and attended, so they actually had to attend within the last 15 months. So this really comes into place when we, you know, we have a young person in foster care who, um, you know, let's say they're attending Roseville High School, and then they get moved to an STRTP in Shasta County, and they attend that S they attend a, it's not reasonable typically for them to attend Roseville High School when they're in Shasta three hours away, right? So they attend the local school in Shasta, then they move back to um, Placer County. And they move, maybe they move to a town other than Roseville, but they really liked it at Roseville and they had some good relationships there. And you know what? Roseville High School has a wellness center and they've got a great foster youth liaison in that district and they've got a lot of supports and the kid was doing pretty well there, right? If we, if, if they have a connection to that school and their ed rights holder thinks it's in their best interest, they have the right to re-enroll in Roseville High School, okay? Um, here's what the actual school of origin rights say. <clears throat> Children have a right to stay at their school of origin throughout the jurisdiction of the court or their experience of homelessness, right? So if their court case or their child welfare involvement or their experience of homelessness crosses over school years, they, they continue to maintain that right to school of origin. If their their um, foster case ends, or if their homelessness ends before the end of the school year, right? So they're homeless, but they get permanently housed in January. That child has the right to remain in that school of origin throughout the end of that school year, if they're up to eighth grade, or until they graduate, if they're in high school. So th think about that for a moment. If you have a young person who is homeless in 10th grade and their family obtains permanent housing midway through their 10th grade year and it's in a town maybe next to or 30 minutes away from um, their school of origin, that 10th grader maintains the right to stay in that school until they graduate. That is because these school changes, they're, they're impactful for any grade level, but they're particularly impactful in high school um, and can have um, much dire consequences um, when a student has to uh, transfer schools midway through their high school career. Um, children have the right to matriculate with their peers. So if you have a student who is homeless in fifth, in fifth grade um, and all of their peers are matric matriculating to one particular middle school, they have the right to matriculate with their peers. Um, in some cases, it might not make sense for that child to attend their school of origin, right? So in my previous example, student attending Roseville High School, they um, go to an STRTP in Shasta County. Um, distance learning is maybe not in their best interest, right? We're not going to push for them to get transported back to Roseville every single day when they're three hours away, right? Um, however, what the law says is that we must determine whether waiving that right is in their best interest through a best interest determination process. So the main message here is that school of origin is the default. Foster and homeless youth should not be automatically transferred to a new school when they move. We really want to ask that question, those hard questions. Is it reasonable for them to um, continue attending the school? How can we make that possible? How can we put a transportation plan together? Um, how connected are they to that school? And, and these conversations are very individualized, right? So um, let's say a child moves an hour away from their school of origin. Um, for a first grader, may, maybe that that's going to warrant a best interest. You know, an hour um, there and an hour back every day for a six-year-old, 
is, is probably a lot. Um, but for an 11th grader, right, who's, you know, really connected to school and maybe plays sports or has a lot of friends or is super close to graduating, um, that, that hour may not be an unreasonable distance. The one caveat to this is if a student has an IEP that requires um, some type of specialized classroom or school placement, such as a non-public school. It gets a little bit complex here because there's some um, uh, conflict between IDEA or special education law and the foster and homeless law. And in that case, I encourage you to consult with your local SELPA. Our local SELPA gets involved in these conversations all of the time and also helps us facilitate best interest processes, processes with all of the right people involved. Um, so why am, I, why am I really focusing on school of origin? Here's why this data is specific to foster youth, but you know, these school changes are incredibly impactful. Um, every school change can result in a loss of four to six months of academic skill attainment, um, new teachers, new peers, new procedures, new rules. Um, it's incredibly stressful, especially for a child who has probably already experienced some additional um, instability, right? They've already had to move home placements. They've already moved from one hotel to a shelter to a doubled up situation. Um, and so school can often be that anchor and that place where young people feel safe and feel that consistency um, and that predictability. Um, so we really um, push hard to um, honor school stability for these young people. Um, okay, so, so in some cases, as I described before, what are we supposed to do if it's in question or if it's unreasonable? And here's what the law says. We're supposed to hold a best interest determination process. And there's a few folks that really need to be in this room. The education rights holder um, in the case of a foster youth or a parent or guardian in the case of a homeless youth. Um, that district's liaison. And then please include the youth. Please include the young person in that conversation, or at least for a part of that conversation. Um, I, I have a first grader, and he can tell me what he thinks about school, and he can tell me what he wants and what he needs to be successful in school. So first graders who are homeless or foster can do that as well. Um, what are we supposed to consider in this best interest process? These things. <laughs> um, the biggest one that we often encounter is travel time. Um, we also want to think about um, the timing of the transfer, right? So um, in that previous example where a first grader is going to travel an hour, if we are approaching, you know, the end of the school year, can we wait to do that transfer until the beginning of the next school year? Um, how long is that placement going to be? Are they in an emergency foster placement? Are they only going to be in this homeless um, shelter for two weeks? right, even if it's far away from their school of origin. So these are the things that we really want to consider. Um, honestly, you know, COVID and schools offering uh, various uh, independent study or a virtual style schooling um, can make this even more possible. Okay, so you're staying two hours away um, for a month while we figure out a more local placement for you. We're not going to transfer you to that local school, um, we're going to keep you enrolled with us through some sort of virtual learning, right? We, we, can, we can consider those decisions now, whereas prior to COVID, maybe we weren't. Um, so these, these are the things that we should be taking into consideration. <clears throat> now, here's for the biggest barrier and the biggest question. It's around transportation. Okay, so the loss that Every Student Succeeds Act says, it's not very strong, <laughs> but school districts and child welfare agencies must work together to develop and implement written transportation procedures. So school districts should have something that says, this is what we do to help support transporting youth in foster care to their schools of origin. Um, Sometimes school districts can do things like reimbursing resource parents 
um, for um, excess travel costs. Sometimes they can give gas cards. Sometimes they can um, send their school buses um, to various places around the county to pick up a child. Sometimes they're arranging for private transportation. Um, I will say that in Placer County, we are so incredibly fortunate in that our child welfare agency has entered into contracts with almost every single one of our school districts to reimburse them for excess costs related to transporting um, Placer County dependents to their schools of origin. Um, this is huge. And this is, um, you know, our school stability rate in Placer hovers um, between 70 and 80 percent, and it is no doubt due to this arrangement. Our school districts are willing to um, set up that private transportation that can be exorbitantly expensive to send their buses across district lines to pick up children and bring them back to their school of origin because um, they're receiving some financial support from our child welfare agency. It's huge. Um, and it's totally possible. In other counties, that cost is shared or split. Um, it's really important to um, have school districts and child welfare talking about how they can make this possible. Um, for homeless youth, it's a little different. Um, transportation um, must be provided at the request of the parent or guardian. Um, or for unaccompanied youth at the request of the liaison. Um, it's really, and what that transportation looks like is really up to the LEA in consultation with the parent. So we find that a lot of our homeless families do have a car and they are able to transport their children to school, but it sure does help if they're gonna get a gas card to support um, offsetting the cost of transporting them to school. The other thing that um, applies to homeless youth is the shared cost. So if you have a, a homeless student living in a hotel in Rockland but attending school in Roseville, the law says that those two school districts can share the costs um, for transportation to school of origin. Um, and, and, you know, in general, our LEAs don't do a ton of this unless they're going to be doing really expensive um, extended transportation through some sort of private means. Um, but it's it's really helpful um, if you are going to be transporting a kid via um, our local agency is Medicab. You know, Medicab can be like $400 a week or more um, to transport a kid six miles. Um, and so it really helps that our LEAs have those relationships and can share those costs. Um, in Placer, like I said, they're sharing the costs. They're using their Title I Part A funds. Um, they might be using their McKinney-Vento grant funds. We at PCOE receive some McKinney-Vento grant funds, and we will um, often partially reimburse our school districts if we know that they've incurred a lot of expenses um, related to transporting McKinney-Vento students. Um, the other thing is that many of our school districts um, recently learned that they're going to be getting some additional financial support for homeless students through the American Rescue Plan. It's, it's sort of hot off the press, um, and it, it the amount is determined by how many homeless students they identified, um, but that extra little bit of money can also be used for transportation. It is the... Um, it is the biggest challenge for us. And it, those all those beautiful people that I showed you earlier, um, they spend a ton of time trying to figure out transportation for students. Okay, so moving on from this, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about, okay, so if we're waiving the right to school of origin and we're um, gonna enroll a child in a new school, here's what the law says about that. These youth have a right to immediate enrollment, even if they don't have all of their required documentation. Um, they also, school districts that are receiving these students, um, they, have, they need to request records from the previous school within two days. And that requesting school, um, or the, the receiving school must forward those requests within two days. So we want to get those cumulative um, folders transferred as soon as possible. A lot of times that required documentation is in that old CUME folder. 
Um, this does not mean that young people um, never have to, you know, go through, get their immunizations or provide proof of that. It just gives them a little bit of a longer window and we don't want it to be a barrier to um, their enrollment. I will say, again, if you have a young person that you're working with who has an IEP, um, it's, it's pretty important to get that IEP as soon as possible um, because that is going to impact where that child attends in the receiving district. Um, so sometimes um, that immediate enrollment can be a little bit delayed if we don't have that IEP, uh, particularly if the IEP um, um, has some specialized classroom placement in it. Okay, just a, a note about, this is um, specific to youth in foster care. Um, sometimes youth in foster care, their um, legal guardians or bio parents retain ed rights. Sometimes those ed rights are limited, which essentially means that they're, they're stripped. Um, and I want to talk about um, the difference between an ed rights holder's rights with regard to youth and foster care and resource parents' rights or foster parents. So um, sometimes I'll collectively refer to them as caregivers. So if a resource parent or a group home staff or an other caregiver does not have ed rights, they still can make some educational decisions for youth in their care, right? They can sign permission slips. They can receive grades and behavior reports. Um, they can help enroll the student in school and in extracurricular activities. However, um, if they don't have ed rights, they cannot be the signer on that IEP, um, and they also should not be making unilateral decisions about school placement. So we see this happening all of the time where well-meaning resource parents will just automatically um, move towards transferring a child into their neighborhood school. And I've, I've um, really tried to remind our school districts and, and advocates that um, if you receive an, a new enrollment for a foster youth, um, we should be asking the question, huh, why aren't they attending their school of origin? Is that reasonable? Is that possible? Does this resource parent know that they have that right? You know, can we have a conversation about this? Um, again, because of school stability is so important. I just want to also add here that, um, you know, typically in Placer County, um, caregivers like resource parents are not granted ed rights. Um, so if ed rights are going to be limited for a biological parent or legal guardian, um, they are, are typically looking to give them to a court appointed special advocate or somebody else in the family. It can be very complicated to award ed rights to a resource parent, um, particularly because um, if that child moves from that placement, um, their old placement might still hold ed rights. And that just can be, um, you can imagine how complicated that could be. We have another question. Um, yeah. If they are new to the country and to the district, but they are homeless, um, I'm assuming the next part would be what would happen in that case. Um, so we're, we're talking about possibly an unaccompanied youth who is um, new to the country, new to California, new to the district. Um, it would, it depends. So a, a lot of times those young people are considered unaccompanied and would have um, the rights that um, I'm, I'm describing here for um, students who are homeless. I would look at a couple things, like who is that child living with? Um, I would get a caregiver affidavit um, completed. Um, wherever, whatever country they came from, I would make effort to reach out to um, their legal guardian in that country and see if you can um, see if that person wants to be involved in their education or is um, safely able to be involved in their education. Um, those are just a couple of things off the top of my head, but certainly if they if they meet that criteria of not having fixed adequate and, um, oh gosh, I'm forgetting my own definition of homelessness. If they meet the other otherwise um, definition of homeless, then I would consider them McKinney Bento. And there's probably additional resources and supports for a young person in that situation. 
Um, there's a clarification that they are with their parents. They are with their parents, but they're um, migrant youth. Um, if they're so again, if they're homeless and they're with their parents, they can event out, and we can extend all of these rights to that person. Um, if they are um, a migrant youth who's un undocumented and the families are undocumented, I don't feel prepared to um, talk about what rights those students have. Um, I know that that some of these rights are extended to them, but I, I don't feel um, I'm not the expert in that. And so I would um, I would look to your local uh, immigration law community agency to see if there's specific rights that are extended to those students. Thanks. Yeah. OK, I'm I'm like 15 minutes out and I don't know how many slides I've left. OK, I think this is um, one of the last kind of laws that I'm going to talk about, which is the reduced graduation um, or graduation exemption law. So it's like a, a number jumble because <laughs> there's different laws um, applying to different populations of students. But this is basically when a young person who is in foster care or homeless transfers schools anytime after their second year of high school. So they're actively foster or homeless and they have that school transfer. What that means is that they are eligible to be assessed for um, the graduation exemption. Um, I can't emphasize this more. It is not automatic. What this right is, is for them to be assessed by somebody who understands the local graduation requirements to see if they um, are eligible and would benefit from this. Um, this fact sheet from the Alliance for Children Rights and the um, Children's Law Center is a great resource that you can um, use for yourself, but also to give to young people. Basically, what it's it's an art, not a science. It involves um, a school counselor or somebody who understands looking at that child's transcript and asking, is it reasonable for this child to meet our local graduation requirements by their fourth or fifth year of high school. Um, and if it is not reasonable, then they can be qualified for this exemption, which requires them to um, have 130 credits, the California graduation requirements, and to pass the KC. The other thing that I always um, emphasize when we encounter young people um, who've transferred schools after their second year of high school is, um, sorry, this is going to be a lot of words, but they also have the right to partial credits. So this top one here talks about the rights to partial credits for um, homeless youth. And sorry, it's long, but I, you know, if you print out this PowerPoint later, I wanted you to have it. Um, this is how the right applies. Um, to youth and foster care. So a lot of schools can be a little weird about awarding partial credits, but they all have to do it. <laughs> um, and if they don't have their own calculation method, there's a calculation method, there's a partial credit model policy. So we were able to do this for a young person who she, you know, qualified for AB 167, but we were able to find that there was like 10 partial credits that she had earned at her previous school. And that those 10 credits really make a difference when we're looking at high school graduation. So, um, yes, we should be assessing to see if they qualify for the graduation exemption, and we should also be looking to see if there's partial credits that they have earned. Um, in particular, just so you know, this is something we really want to pay attention to as youth are coming into and out of a juvenile detention facility, because when, typically when they are in a JDF, they are attending school and earning credits. Okay. Um, so I, I just gave you a little sample um, of some of the laws and rights that are extended to these students. Um, if you believe that, um, you know, despite advocacy and despite um, kind of making these rights and laws known to folks that they're still being violated, um, AB 367 in particular for foster youth allows for um, anyone really to file a complaint 
about these rights not being honored. The other thing that I would say in regard to youth and foster care is if you find that their rights are not being honored, minor's attorney is a great advocate for, for students. You know, they tend to be very busy and have very high caseloads, but um, in our county, um, CLC is our, our, the law firm that represents our students, and they are dogged, and they are wonderful when it comes to advocating for the rights of our students. Um, so um, you can use AB 367 to um, address any concerns, and then also um, lean on the other advocates that are there to support young people. Um, for homeless youth, you know that that education liaison, that district liaison is really kind of anointed as a, an advocate for that um, student. And so um, ask them to do that. OK, I think we're almost done. Just want to talk a little bit about some strategies for um, being trauma informed with young people in this situation. And I apologize, this is going to be some laundry lists. Um, and this this comes directly from the team um, that I have the honor of working with day in and day out. They helped me generate um, these lists over their years of experience um, working with these young people. So a couple of do's for youth and foster care. Um, really important to recognize that no matter how bad a child's situation was before they became a youth in foster care, that separation is an additional trauma. It's an additional trauma. Um, we should never assume that young people um, feel grateful for being in foster care. Um, really important to um, identify the core professional and natural supports that are in the student's life and include them in important school-based meetings and events. Um, so, you know, letting them know about back to school night, letting them know about, you know, we just had a trunk or treat at my kid's school, like get these folks involved in that. Um, get your appropriate releases signed so that you can work hand in hand with these folks and provide um, support um, that, is, that is not happening in a vacuum. Um, mentoring and check, like checking in with young people in this situation on a regular basis is all, also really important. Um, you never know, particularly if they're in like a congregate care setting, what their night was like. <laughs> um, so having a touch point or a person that they can really lean on um, on the campus is so important. I did a focus group with some youth in our um, independent living program a, a year ago, and they, they just uniformly said that like having a person on campus who proactively checked in with them um, and didn't wait for them to, to come into their office was really critical. A couple of do nots. <clears throat> um, these young people have had a lot of their power taken away. Um, they, they, a lot of times um, young people in foster care who have big behaviors in school um, it's about finding some power. It's about finding some agency in their life. So give them opportunities to have a voice, to make decisions, include them, even if they're young. Um, they absolutely can tell you um, what they want and what they need. A couple of, um, same with McKinney-Vento families, a couple of do's. Um, we be, we're mindful of language with these students. We want to make sure that um, we're, we're not using the term homeless unless the families have actively used that. So we'll say McKinney-Vento, we'll say you might qualify for some McKinney-Vento because of your unstable housing or, or because you're in between places right now. Um, have those posters up and, and visible. Um, making um, school supplies and hygiene supplies and snacks available to these students. I won't call them out, but one of our wonderful school-based mental health st staff um, raids the school cafeteria and delivers snacks to these students um, wherever they're staying. Um, these families also um, should be automatically enrolled in free and reduced lunch program. They don't need to fill out that application. They should just get it, free lunch, free breakfast, um, all the time. Um, and then finally, um, you know, in our county, and I think in most counties, we have a 2-1-1 system where um, 
Uh, you can get families connected to housing services. Uh, it can be a really stressful phone call. It can take a really long time. So um, prepping families for what to expect when they make that phone call um, and maybe being there with them while they do it goes a long way towards building trust. And then a couple of do nots. <clears throat> I'm running out of time, so I might go a bit quicker. Um, one thing to note is that, you know, families have told us that they were initially reticent to reveal their living situation because they thought that it would result in their kids getting taken away. So we really want to emphasize that um, this is not, homelessness alone is not enough for child welfare intervention. And also students who are homeless, you know, they don't need inter-district transfers. They don't need to provide proof. You, do not ask the families that they're doubled up with to complete forms and to fill out a residency affidavit. That is not required. Um, there is, um, if you suspect that a family is perhaps being dishonest about their living situation, contact your county office and they will guide you with what to do in that. Um, but don't take it upon yourselves to um, deny enrollment. Um, just a couple of, I'm going to just go through these really quick, a couple of tier one strategies. We're a big MTSS, PBIS county here in Placer, so we think in terms of pyramids. Um, again, you know, school staff, in my experience, do not tend to know um, the rights that are extended to these students, nor what it's really like for them in their home environments and in the community. So not only is it important to, um, in a sensitive way, notify need to know folks in the school, um, but also to um, help them practice trauma-informed strategies in supporting this young person. Um, couple of tier two and three strategies. Um, somebody said this already, but that I loved, um, which is um, offering support groups. You know, a lot of times young people in this situation feel like they are the only one. They may think that they're the only child in foster care, the only one who's dealing with these situations in their living situation. Um, and so we, as much as possible, thinking about how we can get young people together with other peers who have similar experiences so that they can um, share that and talk about how they've coped and how they've um, thrived despite that. Um, I'm a big believer in group services um, as a way to reduce stigma and increase peer support on campus. <clears throat> I think the, the last thing that I want to share with the group is, um, you know, one of the things that PCOE did um, as a result of the pandemic was we started a, a referral form where any of our districts could refer students of concern um, to us. Um, and we've, um, we've expanded this form to include um, any young people in foster care or who are homeless at risk of CSAC, have emerging attendance issues, um, or who have um, mental health needs that can't be met in the school. Um, and so um, we really, um, this, this process has really served to um, increase opportunities for um, sharing of this information and this advocacy with our schools. Um, just the other day, as a result of someone completing this form, I was able to sit with a principal and give them like a 10 minute primer on McKinney Vento. And through that conversation, like five more students at his school were identified. So um, anything that you can do to kind of share this information and share about your services um, will really go a long way towards um, getting these students the rights that they need and deserve. Um, and then I think this is it. I This is my favorite quote from Bruce. I don't actually know if Bruce Perry said it. Now I'm, I'm learning that he might not have said it. Um, but um, I believe that this is who we are in education. We all have the opportunity to um, be in a naturally occurring healthy relationship with a student. Um, and so I just want to appreciate all of the um, health professionals and educators and advocates that are um, with us today. And um, with two minutes to go, I think I'm, I'm done. Thank you so much, Alicia. Yes. Um,
I am going to be linking the evaluation in the chat um, and fill it out. And I believe there's a bit of time for questions, maybe like a minute. And I will, you know what, I'm going to put my email, or can you put my email, can I type in the chat? I can. I'm going to put my email in the chat so if folks have um, follow-up questions or you want to know who your local county people are, um, county office of ed people, um, I, work, I work with those folks so I can help you figure that out. Did it pop up? Yeah, it did. Okay. And it looks like we are out of time. I hope to see you all in the closing session with Lance McGee. Have a great rest of your day, everyone.